So I want to say good morning. Uh, we can start without uh, the podium, of course. I want to say good morning to all of you, uh, especially if you're a first-time guest. Uh, we're glad that you were able to be here today. Uh, we hope that today is going to be a blessing to you. And so it, as a way of helping us, uh, we'd love for you to take a few moments today and fill out your Connect card. The front side of that card is just information about you that we'd love to have. We'd love to be able to make a connection with you. We'd love to know how the service has impacted you today, and so uh, if, it, if the service does have an impact on you and you'd like to know more about uh, how to, to, to grow in your faith or take your next step in your journey, you can, uh, you can indicate that on the back of your card and hold on to the completed Connect card and place it in the offering plate as it goes by at the end of our service today. Uh, and so I, I also want to say a great thank you to those who have come for our church work days. Uh, we had another one yesterday, uh, and it was, it was pretty intense. There was a lot of heavy lifting and intense physical labor that went on. And so many of the, the people that you might see walking around like zombies are probably just stiff from having their muscles uh, worked out, and I am one of those. I didn't work nearly as hard as most of the people there, uh, but it was certainly, uh, certainly a great day. We got a lot accomplished in our office building. Uh, we got uh, the carpet torn out, which was glued down with like the most gorilla strength glue we've ever seen. It was not easy. All right, I'm just going to use this, huh? All right, let's do it. So we have, uh, we, we have made a lot of progress already, and there's still, of course, a lot to be done. Um, we, we have other work days that are going to be planned. Let's see if I can talk and figure this out at the same time. You can see how helpless I am up here without my, without my people. Um, but at any rate, um, but the work days have accomplished a, a tremendous amount, and it is setting us up and positioning us to be ready for when we get the final drawings approved and when we get ready to actually uh, begin the process where we're getting contractors in there. And so every little bit helps. And so I'm so grateful for those who came and were, were part of the workday yesterday. Um, so uh, if you see another workday come up, we hope that you can be a part of that and plan to be a part of that because we cannot make the progress without your help. Uh, so I want to begin today by talking about uh, different ways to get things done. Now, many of you know the longer you live, the more you realize there's, there's, there are a lot of different ways to accomplish a lot of different things, right? For example, uh, this week I did a Google search with the words different ways to, and then I left it blank, and I, I let Google just populate that search bar for me, and here's what I came up with, and I just picked the, the top five. Um, so when I typed in different ways to, here's what came up. The first one was different ways to worship God. So there are all kinds of ways. Maybe, it know, maybe Google knows that I'm a pastor. Or maybe it knows that it's already figuring out what my, what my interests are. And so it put that in there. Well, th that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing on the list, I kid you not, was different ways to cook an egg. Now, I know how to cook an egg, but apparently there are at least 11 different ways to cook an egg, by the way. Uh, and then uh, I looked up, uh, I, the third one on the list was different ways to tie a tie. So apparently there are 18 different ways to tie a necktie. Who knew, right? 18 different ways. Uh, how about lacing shoes? That was number four. I found six different ways to lace your running shoes online. So if you want to know all of those, maybe you can look those up yourself. There are also, the bottom of the list, uh, the bottom of the top five was different ways to say, I love you. Now, according to RomanceTracker.com, there are 101 different ways to say I love you using other romantic words. So file that away for Valentine's Day so you know different ways to say I love you. Well, the point is that there are different ways to do many different things to accomplish the same goal. And that's good because we like variety. You can look around the room and determine that we all like variety. We like to do things differently. We, we wear different clothes. We have different hairstyles. Each of us is different. So there are different ways to do the same thing. Well, I want to apply that to... to uh, some of the training I got as a pastor years and years ago. I went, I've gone through, uh, in my 28 years of ministry, I've gone through probably half a dozen programs and methods on how to share your faith or how to share the gospel and tell other people about Jesus. I started out when I was an intern in 1989 at Michelle's church, uh, Michelle's home church. We were trained in a program called Evangelism Explosion. Anybody ever heard of that? 
Evangelism Explosion by Dr. D. James Kennedy uh, in uh, Coral, uh, actually in Fort Lauderdale, Coral Ridge Presbyterian. Um, I, learned, I learned that program. I learned a program called the Peace Treaty. I learned, uh, in fact, I took a, a former church through the program Becoming a Contagious Christian. And each of those programs is, is about sharing the gospel with people who don't know about Jesus, spreading the good news. But each of those programs suggest and come from a different approach. Each of them has a different method. Sometimes it's, it's very heavy, uh, dependent upon memorizing verses, or you have to remember a presentation. You've got to use illustrations that are metaphors for the gospel. You have to learn ways to anticipate objections and questions that people might have and how you can answer them. Some of them really did require extensive memorization of Scripture and conversation starters to, to lead interested people to Christ. In fact, a couple of the programs that I was trained on were built on this idea of door-to-door, going door-to-door, knocking on doors, making cold calls on those who have maybe visited the church, or you get names and addresses from people that uh, have been passed on by loved ones, you follow up on them. Sometimes we went out into the streets, by, uh, we started conversations by passing out tracts or doing questionnaires with complete strangers. Now, every system of sharing the gospel has strengths. Every system of sharing the gospel is is really, I think, leaning, pushing in the right direction. And it, it really calls on you to stretch your faith and learn to overcome your fears of rejection and uh, of really even talking to strangers. But almost all of the training that I've received included a point in time where I was called upon to share my personal story about how Jesus had changed my life. In fact, in my humble opinion, when I had to share my story about what Jesus had done in my life, that was one of the most effective parts of the training. When you came to the place where nobody knows your story better than you, and you decide that you're going to share what God has done in your life. So while there may be different methods and models of telling others about the gospel of Christ, each of them come together in this thought that no presentation of the gospel is complete unless you tell what it means to you. So why would, you try, why would someone buy a product from you if you're a salesman if you are not convinced of its value? Why would someone decide to check out church one Sunday? Why would someone decide to, to try to believe in the Savior if you yourself don't have a convincing story? Because what I want to tell you this morning, Compassion, is that your story matters. It matters to the people that, that know you and love you. It matters because your family, your friends, and your co-workers are going to be interested. And when you show genuine interest in other people, when you invest in them, when you listen to their concerns, you build authentic relationships with them, they're going to reciprocate, and they're going to want to know more about you. So we tend to get close to people with similar interests and backgrounds, so it's likely that they're going to relate to some of your spiritual experiences as well. And that's why uh, you may think, well, my story is, is not very glamorous. You know, my story was, was not sensational. My story is not dramatic. I, you know, I didn't grow up in, in a rough background. I grew up in a church family. I grew up in a believing family, and I came to faith. Maybe you think your story doesn't have that element of, you know, kind of a, a seedy past. But even growing up as a, a good person, other people are going to be able to identify with your story because they have similar backgrounds. In fact, it it, it always takes me back to this idea that your story is hard to argue with. In fact, it was Charles Swindoll who said uh, something that I think is is very, it brings a lot lot of light to bear on what I'm talking about today. Charles Swindoll said, the skeptic may deny your doctrine or attack your church, but he cannot honestly ignore the fact that your life has been changed. So you have a story of how God has done something in your life. And maybe today you're not quite there yet. You're, you're thinking, well, my story is still being written. I'm still a work in progress. I don't yet know what God is going to do in my life. But we live in an exper- uh, experiential culture uh, where people want to know not just if Christianity is true, but whether or not it works. They want to know, is it working in your life? Has it made a difference in your life? So your story can powerfully illustrate the fact that God is alive in you and it has affected how you think and what you value and the way you live, which is why it's very important for us 
to do everything we can to live authentic Christian lives. It's the best argument for other people to follow Jesus. It's your life, your witness, your story. And so today, I want you to see that being prepared to tell others how God has changed your life can be life-changing for them. Your story of how God changed you can be life-changing for other people. So as we find ourselves in part two of the series uh, that we're in uh, through the book of Galatians called Free, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Now in Galatians 1, in the last half of the chapter, Paul is doing exactly what I've been talking about for the last few moments. He's, he's sharing his own story as evidence that the gospel is true. So if you have your Bibles in Galatians 1, you'll find verse 11. I'll join you there in a moment. But I want to recap just a moment from last week. If you remember, last week we saw that um, the, in, the Galatians, uh, in the Galatian region, the churches had started to believe a perverted gospel. They believed in something that wasn't true, that was being twisted. And so Paul was, was trying to show the Galatians there's only one gospel. There's only one truth. And it was the one that he was preaching, and it was the one that had changed his life. And part of the case he was making is that only the power of Jesus could have changed someone like him. So if you pick up in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, and the verses are going to be up on the screen, but I would encourage you every week to bring your own Bible. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, here's what it says. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. And then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, which is Simon Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, and here, here's the critical part of this passage. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praised God because of me. Now, there's some things in, in this passage I want you, us to be very aware of, and I want us to know what this passage means and then what it means to us. How do we, how do we make it work in our lives starting today? Well, Paul was writing this letter partly to address rumors that he had been preaching a message that had been plagiarized and copied, that he had gotten in, in bits and pieces from the other apostles, and then without their consent, he was twisting it to meet his own selfish agenda. Paul's saying, no, my gospel comes straight from Jesus. He's the one who revealed it to me. He's, he, he, he's the one who appeared to me on the road to Damascus. And I have been changed because of it. And then he offers evidence to support what had happened. In fact, first of all, he says that he had an encounter with Jesus. So Paul actually had an encounter with Christ. And so your notes there will just fill in. Paul had an actual encounter with Jesus. Now he refers them back to verse 13 where he, he's saying, my reputation for what I used to do preceded me among a lot of people. He was enemy number one of Christianity during his early days. And so Paul is asking, how else can you explain a conversion as dramatic as mine except that I really actually encountered Jesus. And it was that real encounter that gave him the courage to endure what he did. Now skeptics have a hard time understanding how Christianity really got started. What was it about Jesus that caused 11 ordinary men who were fishermen and blue-collar workers and even Paul, a sworn enemy who hated Christianity with everything in him, what was it that turned them into dedicated, unrelenting advocates for the gospel? I mean, after all, all but one of them died, an uh, died a martyr's death. 
They all were, were put to death in, in uh, very painful ways. Why would people willingly suffer and die for something they know is a lie? Now, there are a lot of people who, there are plenty of examples of people who died for something they thought was true but was a lie, that, that they didn't know was a lie, such as the 900 people who died in Jonestown years ago under the cult leader Jim Jones. But people don't willingly die for something they know to be a lie. So Paul says, think about my life. Now, in other passages, we know about Paul that him converting to Christianity came at a great cost to him. Think about his testimony. He said, five separate occasions, I was given 39 lashes with a whip, all because I preached the gospel. Every time he got up and he kept on preaching. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Now, that's just like one step up in pain level from the whip. More than once, he was publicly stoned. Not that he got high in public, but that basically baseball-sized rocks were hurled at him as, uh, until they thought he was dead. He, uh, he was shipwrecked, <clears throat> excuse me, not once, but three times. So how many times do you have to get shipwrecked before you feel like God is calling you into something other than mission trips? How many times does that happen when you say, you know what, the aquatic life is not for me. I'm not going to do this anymore. What makes someone willing to endure that type of suffering time and time again? Well, again, people will suffer for what, they, what, what is false, but they are not willingly going to suffer for what they know is not true, unless there is something to be gained for it, like money or power. But what would Paul gain from his life? What did Paul gain? Year after year, he embraced a life of suffering to spread the gospel that he had formerly hated. And so this simply rules out the idea that he was using his apostleship as a, as a cover for a con, a, a con game. So Paul used the unrelenting testimony to Jesus as evidence, number one, that his true gospel was what he was preaching. There's, there's a second reason. There's a second reason that Paul gives. Paul's message was consistent and true. Paul's message perfectly aligned with that of the other apostles and prophets who had gone before him. Now, you may think, okay, why do I care about that? Well, it's critical because you will see all through the Bible a phrase or phrases. Sometimes you'll see the phrase, as it is written. Now, when you see that, it should be an indicator that what, ha what they're saying is based on what has been said before. Or when they say these things were written down or, or were done in order to fulfill some scripture. So it's important for you to know that these things will come in, uh, so they'll come in handy when you get in a conversation that might lead to a debate of the scriptures. Now, I want you to listen to me. If, if you're zoned out, you're, you're thinking, you know, what's for lunch? I want you to listen to this, this, this part, okay? Two of the fastest growing religions in, in, the, in the world are Islam and Mormonism, okay? Both of these religions have one thing in common— it's the belief that the founders of the, those religions, Muhammad and Joseph Smith, both received additional revelation from God, from angels. And um, so remember what Paul said last week, that if I or even an angel were to, t were to tell you a different gospel, it's not true. So remember that. Islam and Mormonism are the fastest growing religions. Muslims be uh, believe that there are only four holy books and that the Quran... Corre uh, corrects and supersedes every other prophecy that's gone before it, including the Bible. But here's what we got to remember. The biblical prophets never claimed to supersede or cancel out what the others had said. They all grounded their claims of authority um, based on standing in agreement with the previous prophets. So Isaiah was not saying, you know what Jeremiah said is not really true. What I say is true. So the reason that I would reject the, the messages of Joseph Smith and Muhammad is not because of the deficiencies in their character, which everybody has, but, but they certainly have, but because what they teach stands in opposition to what the Bible says. And it stands in opposition to what has come before it. So that is why, my friends, you need to learn your Bible. Because if you don't know your Bible, you'll never know when you're going to be misled. And as one pastor said, you'll be a sucker for Satan. Like, he, he will be able to, to fool you because you don't know the Bible. If someone contradicts what God has already said, then you're going to know it because you know the Word of God. So you need to be checking and verifying what I'm, even what I'm saying is true by reading the Bible. So Paul noted that 17, that, uh, 17 years after his message... Um, it, it, it didn't change. It was the same as the apostles and the prophets. Even after he experienced Jesus on the road, 
if what he said was contradicting the teaching of the other apostles, he would be the one who was wrong. Uh, in fact, even Simon Peter wrote about Paul. And listen to what uh, Simon Peter said about the writings of Paul. You see it up there in 2 Peter 3.16. Peter said, he writes, being Paul, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. So two things. If you ever struggle to understand the scriptures, you're in good company because Simon Peter did as well. He was a follower of Jesus, one of his closest disciples. Uh, But not only that, Peter elevates the writings of Paul to the level of scripture. He says these things are true. So to summarize, Paul said, I had an encounter with Jesus that was real. And then number two, what I am teaching is consistent and true. Now, the third thing I'll say about Galatians 1, uh, 11 and 24, is that Jesus changed Paul's life. That was the third bit of evidence that he gave. So this is not the same point that I made in the first part. That was regarding the encounter he had with Jesus. But the point is, after he encountered Jesus, Paul's life was changed forever. He went through what Scott McKnight called a biographical reconstruction. A biographical reconstruction. So in other words, the first thing that Paul does is tell his biography in a new way. He says, this is how I once was, and this is how I am now. Because for Paul, what mattered the most before, which was prestige and power and prominence, what mattered to him before no longer mattered. And then what didn't matter to him in his previous life, like the truth of the gospel, now it was all that that mattered. In fact, Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 7, he said it well, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. So his perspective on life is now entirely shaped around his encounter with Jesus. He reconstructed his story, his perceptions about himself. So Paul basically says, you know, here are the ways that I experienced Jesus in my personal life. Here's how Jesus changed me. And so here's what I want you to understand. While you might never see a visible manifestation of the resurrected Jesus like Paul, but I think if you've really met Jesus, if I've really met Jesus, then these things are going to be true of me as well. Paul says, first of all, in verse 15, he says, I see how God pursued me. I see how God pursued me. So when Paul talks about his conversion, he talks as if God was the one acting and he, Paul, was the one being acted upon. Someone who has had a genuine experience with Jesus usually feels like it was a decision that they made, yes, but actually it also feels like it was something that happened to them. Like, like it, it, everything was, was working out the way God wanted it to work out. Less something that they took up and more something that took them up. I mean, every person I know who has a serious walk with Jesus for any length of time looks back and recognizes that God was the one at work in their salvation. I mean, you can look back and see God was putting people in my life God was putting questions in my heart. God was leading me to have random conversations, sometimes even painful experiences, all because he wanted to draw me to himself. So Paul says, you know, that I felt like God was, was pursuing me. The second thing he says that I think could be true of us is that Paul says that God became even more real to me. God became even more real to me. Now, after Paul met Jesus, he didn't spend time with anybody else, no other group of people. It says he went off into the desert alone. But during that time, Jesus obviously appeared to him, spoke to him in a real way, and worked in his way, uh, worked in his life in a real way. Now, parenthetically, here's what I want to say. I don't think it's really ever a good idea to intentionally separate yourself from other believers. I I respect what uh, religious monks do, but I just disagree with their approach. But one thing is true. When you are alone, ask yourself, when I'm alone, is my relationship with Jesus real is it real in fact more real than when i'm with other people you know sometimes we succumb to peer pressure when we get surrounded by excited christians all the time you know like we we kind of piggyback off of their faith and what they're excited about is what we're excited about and that can keep you from having a real encounter with jesus over a sustained period of time I mean, you can't piggyback off others' experiences with God. Paul was exposed to the gospel. He had an actual encounter with Jesus, and he was changed by it. 
So he, he knew who Jesus was. And then the third piece of evidence is that God took away the two biggest areas that Paul struggled with in his life. He struggled with hate, hatred, and he took away his fear. Throughout the book, Paul is going to explain how he was so motivated and driven and controlled by pride and hate and fear that, that they controlled his life. But when he became a follower of Jesus, just like that, it was all gone. And that always happens to a believer. When you don't know God, you're filled with insecurities and fears. And before Christ, for example, Paul had always been in constant competition with other people. I mean, he wanted to advance in Judaism, he said, beyond all of my peers. I wanted to be the top dog in Judaism, and he was well on his way to do that. I was the Jew of Jews, he said, and that desire to prove myself made me constantly jealous of other people and hate them, and ultimately it led Paul to murderous violence. You see, when, when Jesus comes into your life, he's going to take away that hate and that fear, and this is something that you can't even explain. You don't even understand, but you know it's the power of the Spirit working in your life. Now, that is the story of Paul. That's what God did in his life. And it was supported by evidence that he had met the true God and that his hate and his fears were gone. And when people heard his story, there was a common reaction. If you look back at verse 24, the very last verse in that passage we read earlier, here should be the goal and the motivation for when we share our story. And they praised God because of me. I was a reflection of the glory of God. So here's what I want us to ponder this morning as we prepare to close and leave. It's just a way to, to filter the effectiveness of your story. Now, here, here's how you can filter it. Your story should glorify God more than it emphasizes your pre-Christian life. Okay, when you're going to tell someone about Jesus, think about the example of Paul. Now, he did talk about what he was, but he didn't spend a lot of time there and show his medals and all of his, you know, his office with mahogany shelves and leather-bound books and all that. He said, no, 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 that was a little part of my story, but I have been changed by Jesus. There was nothing in Paul's past as a Jew and as a Pharisee uh, that, that would lead us to believe that he would ever be receptive to the gospel. Have you ever thought that there are people in your life that, that you just feel like, you know what, it would take a miracle for them to ever come to Jesus? You, ever, you, you feel that way, right? I know that I do as well. So when people heard how Paul had been changed and that God was the one who, who did the changing, that made his story that much more effective. And so that's what's going to make your story effective as well. This story glor should glorify God. That should be the distinctive mark of the true gospel. You see, all other religions glorify man. The gospel glorifies God. You say, well, how do other religions glorify man? Well, every other religion teaches that you save yourself by how good you are. If you're good enough, you observe the five pillars of Islam. If you're, you're good enough, you'll, you'll walk the eightfold path of Buddha. You'll confess enough. You'll do the sacraments enough. You'll be good enough to create good karma for yourself. Then you'll be saved. Well, they all have in common that if, you, that if you are saved, it's because of what you did. But the gospel is that you're saved not because of how good you are, but because of how good God is and because of what God has done. God gets the glory. The gospel glorifies Jesus because it says that God saved me when I was unworthy all because of his grace, and he alone deserves the honor for it. So rather than raising himself up and crushing those who sinned against him and rewarding the, the, the victorious righteous, God lowered himself and died for them. And that is the message that we must proclaim. Christianity is the only religion that celebrates a God who died and who humbled himself. So when you hear this claim in our culture made by people like the great prophetess of our time, Queen Latifah, at the Grammy Awards years ago when she said the gods of all uh, the gods of the religions have different names but if you peel back the layers all teach the same thing love others if you hear that phrase know that that person is not talking about Christianity Christianity teaches a unique message that you're not saved by your goodness but God's grace and God alone gets the glory which is why CS Lewis said of course Christianity must be from God because who else could have thought it up. 
Now, maybe today you've come from a pretty rough background and there were great odds against you ever finding Jesus. I want you to understand that when you tell your story, when you rehearse it, when you get it down, that your story needs to glorify God. It needs to lead people exactly, directly to the path of Jesus. So Paul gives some evidence for the, for the truth of the gospel. Our gospel, our story, rests on the concrete fact of Jesus' resurrection. It, it is true because it's based on the truth, but it is also subjective. I mean, if you think about your story of how God changed you from being maybe a person of pride, a person of great addictions, a person of hate, to being a person who is humble and generous toward God and others, that's the gospel. So the questions I want to leave you with today is this. The gospel is objectively true, that Jesus died for your sins, and that he can raise you to new life if you would just receive him by faith, and that one day he's coming back to reward all of those who have accepted him and, and take them to eternity. Have you believed that? And then the second thing is, do you believe the gospel that the apostles preached? Do you believe what the gospel is, that Jesus did it all, you can only repent and receive it? The gospel has been verified, friends. Can you point to the change it's made in your life? Can you look back and say, you know what? I know when I, was, when I accepted Jesus, maybe I know when I was baptized, I know when I started church. That's not what I'm asking. Can you look back and see evidence of how Jesus has changed your life? When you do find that moment, when you can objectively identify that, seize on that and let that be the the motivation the fuel for telling other people because we are free according to what paul says we're free because of what god has done not because of what we have done let's pray together father today i pray that we can see evidence of, of you in our lives we can see evidence of change lord that you have made and lord if we can't see how jesus is real and at work in our life Lord, I pray that we would go back to the start and recapture our first love, that we would go back, Lord, and, and see what it takes to, to reactivate what, is, uh, what has been stalled out. Lord, I pray that today someone will be drawn to you for the very first time, Lord, that they would say yes to you and, and accept you as Lord and Savior. God, only you can do the changing. Only you can bring life change. And God, I pray that that would happen today as we stand together and uh, give our response to you, Lord, through this song. And we pray in Jesus' name.